and I've, okay. I've actually taught both. I've taught RTO courses, which is the TAFE, and I've also taught on the Central Coast with Metro Screen a non-qualified course. So I could teach whatever I wanted, mm. basically. I could teach whatever I thought was most important, and that's very freeing. Mm. This is what's imposed most, and I don't have to follow these unit guys and do all of this and assess you in that sense. I can teach what I think you most need to know. Mm. Um, you, Pat, oh, uh, let me go to you first, Julie. Um, you, you're not an RTO, you're, you're just a private arts teacher. Uh, do you yes. think it's better not to be going for this qualification, just teach what you think is really important? Get down to the nuts and I bolts? I think you have to decide early on whether you want to go that direction or not, uh, whether to be qualified and uh, find work, be, as you say, a working artist, um, so-called professional, but I debate that, mm. um, or whether you just want to pursue the joy of it and your own path of creativity because art to me is about expressing and sharing number one but as soon as you get into the commercial side of it it slips sideways and you have to compromise all the way I chose not to com compromise but that's pretty rare today and there are opportunities to work online uh, many areas because of the digital era. Mm. Uh, art is sort of probably the best area that uh, online teaching can address mm. um, in 2D anyway with drawing in that level mm. but there's nothing like that juicy paint the real thing yeah. <laughs> and looking your teacher in the eye feeling the vibes and feeling the uh, atmosphere of a class situation so Patrick, what's mm. your take on how important is a qualification in the arts? Yeah, look, I think perhaps there's a misconception, misperception of what a qualification in the arts might actually give you. I, I think it's not about what qualification you have, it's about what you've gained on the, on the way to gaining that qualification. So what does the curriculum through that course deliver for you so when you finish at the end point you've achieved X now I need to do Y to get me to mm. to where you want to go so uh, look I've never been concerned about whether I've had a, a bachelor or a master's uh, or, or anything like that I've done those along the way because they I guess they fitted an agenda I did my master's degree not because I wanted to have a, a higher level of education it's because that was a way for me to achieve I guess structured learning and cheap music lessons is what it was. <laughs> I had to write a thesis to get it, but you know there was um, an amount of work that had to go into it. But I went down that path because that was the right way for me to go at that point in time. Right. So at the very least, the qualification is a structured course where they're teaching you everything that arguably you should need there to is know. There is a curriculum in place that an expert or panels of experts have put together which they <coughs> deem and hopefully their fraternity deem mm. appropriate and successful in allowing a, a student to get to where they want well, to I'm go. I'm going to be devil's advocate here because having taught RTO courses, mm. sometimes what's in those units isn't that relevant or very up to date. Mm -hmm. And I often find in my area of film and digital media, the piece of paper doesn't mean much mm. to a potential employer. Mm as long as you can show them some work and then they say yes you can do that you are good at this i can see you've made a short film or you've made this animation or whatever it might be you're good i don't care that you've got a diploma i don't mm. care that you you know you clearly have talent um should we be encouraging for the arts these kind of qualifications rto courses masters etc or should it be going more to the private schools like you guys are doing is that where you know the ground level of it all actually happens. Ian. Well, I, sorry, you want to talk uh, about? Yeah, I, I like the lack of pressure of the, as you were saying before, you, you coined it beautifully in that you felt no pressure, you could teach what you wanted to teach. And once again, that comes back to, to m the Mad Cow School, the way we run things, is, is having that open flexibility. And, and I, I understand that the, the you know, funding bodies and, and having, um, your registered training organisation. That is a, a necessary um, run in a structure with a hierarchy. Um, and I don't work in those hierarchies. My <laughs> other job, I work in a hierarchy. So I love to be able to come out and express myself and just be open and free. Fair. And that's, that's how I t taught myself and, and learned. I, I have no, well, no qualification. Most artists do tend to teach themselves after all. Jump yes. in, do it. Yeah. 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 Um, 
in, in our field, the dancing world, um, there has been a lot of controversy over the last sort of decade about standardisation because you've got a lot of people that would just open up a dance school, no tra not, not enough training, not sufficient training anatomically mm. for young mm. people, uh, lots of injuries, um, lots of issues, physical issues while the dancers are training, obviously not enough understanding of how the body should work in a, you know technical forms because it is you know you're putting your whole body at risk. Well this is the reason for a registered training organization they've yes. they've been vetted and they have teachers who are qualified and vetted so presumably they know what they're doing and they're going to do it right. Yes now obviously there's a lot of dance place uh, dance schools and and tertiary not I wouldn't say tertiary level but you know for dancers that want to embark on professional dance careers so what we're offering in our school is you can do both. You can you can have all that physical training, like Patrick, that is that stepping stone into getting into a professional dance company. But you've got a qualification. So, if, if anything happened to you physically, mm. you have that piece of paper, that diploma to go. Well, I'd like to go to university now. I'll use that diploma to jump into a, an advanced diploma, or I'd like to go into a slightly different mm. field of dance because mm. you know you've got dance critiquing. You've got um, you know, backstage, you've got management, you've got all different areas of dancing that you, you can go into. So it's not just the mm. physical in fact, dancing. The one key reason I would encourage people to do an RTO course in whatever form of art they want to go into is most artists don't make a living doing the art, but they can teach it. Yes. And if you've got the qualification, you can teach it. That's it. You know, at an RTO. Yeah. So I think while they're doing all that training for what, two, three years? In it, well, for us, it's three years if they want to go right through to diploma, and that's when they leave school. You know, you think, well, why don't you get a qualification after spending all that money? It just makes sense. Mm. Um, but they get, but our course was written purely with exactly what we think our students need. Mm. So although you've got that guidelines from the, um, the government, yeah. you know, you write your course exactly how you believe your students what they need. So down the road, you know, another dance school could offer exactly the same diploma, somebody else could offer the same diploma, but you look into the course and it's what they're offering. They're offering different things. They're, they're um, what do you call it, majoring in different, different yeah. facets. So, and I agree with um, what you said sort of before in regards to, you know, should, should we just be more free? But we are in many ways because we've designed the course to have our freedom mm. to work with it, but bring out the strengths of what we believe our dancers need, whether it be because of our community, our, you know, being in Australia, uh, our state, or what we just truly believe as experts, what our dancers need for international. I think the best situation is if you've got really qualified people, good people in their craft, teaching it, and have the freedom to teach what they believe is the best way, whether it yeah. matches the, the, the curriculum yeah. or not of an RTO. Mm. Um, but We've talked about that kind of higher qualification for the, the training of professional artists. Let's talk about the education of, you know, where we started. Is there enough art education, art, music, theatre generally in primary school, high school, just as a part of the curriculum? No. <laughs> Patrick, you have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, look, I, I, I don't think there is enough emphasis on that within schools. And I think the fact that generalist primary teachers uh, gain, I think, in a general um, generalist primary degree, come out as a primary teacher, four-year trained bachelor, uh, six weeks worth of music training. That's not really going to produce, I believe, a, um, a teacher that can competently and probably more importantly, confidently teach that art form. Uh, that's it, assuming they even teach it at all. Well, that's right. And, and look, they may not be interested in it. And so therefore, how does someone uh, achieve curriculum outcomes if there's A, no interest, and B, they're you know, uh, you know, not confident in actually delivering that, that component? Okay, so why should there be more music in primary schools? Why should there be more? <laughs> because uh, music uh, gives students uh, so many benefits. Um, there's the whole left-right brain um, uh, studies that have gone on. There's so much information ab about that now. Basically, musicians think on a different level. That's fact. 
uh, we're better at problem solving, uh, well, some of us are, um, and um, I think being in, involved in things like um, band programs and instrumental tuition, there's a level of uh, commitment that needs to be given by the student. They need to learn about work ethic and just a whole raft of, I guess, life skills. They can't learn this any other way? Or just well, a look, way of doing well it? look, I, I guess they can, but I think it, it's one way that uniquely delivers that and also it allows self-expression at the same time. Which Julie, uh, what about um, visual arts in primary schools? Is there enough of it and if not, what, well, why should it be there? Well, I can't speak for all the schools. <laughs> but they, they do seem to be quite different. You know, the, the ones I've been involved in through putting on school plays with them and things like that. I sort of crossed over into your, your drama area at one point. Um, it just varies from school to school, mm. really it does. But from high school level, I'm very, very impressed with their final works. I think that they're honest and expressing their view of the world without any idea of their own ego involved. Sorry, touch the mic. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm quite impressed with what I've seen coming out at the end of it. And um, children are wonderful, you know, with a good teacher and good materials in to inspire them, they can go all the way. Well, one thing Bad materials, sorry. a not inspired teacher can put them off for life. Um, in, in our package earlier, we saw Rendra, uh, who teaches drumming classes, mm. Uh, saying he'd rather not be teaching young children mm. because it's babysitting as far as he's concerned. But the parents really want to learn this. Uh, have you had much of experience where, where you are teaching younger kids and it's really the parents are vicariously learning it through them. They're, they're doing what their dream they never got to mm. fulfil. Well, yeah, that, that's a political <laughs> issue a little bit. <laughs> uh, you've, got the, you've got, obviously got the dance parents. <laughs> mm. they, we label them. Um, but look, it, You've got definitely, I just think what Patrick was saying before, what you know, when you're asking why should we be doing more of you know, the arts, I just think we, we are created to, to dance, sing, dramatise, to, to use all those senses, to use all those um, you know, naturalness. I mean, it, it's, you see a little child when they're happy, they're dancing. All you need to do is just take that naturalness and start moulding it into something a little bit more perfected. Mm. We call dance, mm. you know, or go at drama or go music, but they feel it, you know, it's, it's natural. And then, you know, I just think that that needs to be reserved. It helps children learn. So I actually do sessional lecturing for a local college as well in dance. So they, I'm teaching primary school, um, high school teachers, like to be teachers. Um, early childhood and PE and I have to do a little dance component and one thing I strongly tell them all the time is don't just look at dance as a little activity physically it is a way to teach because you've got children who are just not they're not academic they're not um, you know they're, they're not really smart they feel that there's you know they can't contribute but as soon as you get them to move, they learn in a different light. So you can teach them about the sunshine, you can teach them about the planets, you can teach them about anything through dance. So with little kids, you know, I've got my baby's ballet class. They've learned about the planets, they've learned about the growth of the, um, the vegetables, because we're dancing it, we're expressing it. We are the vegetables, we plant the trees. You know, then we're swaying in the wind. We know what happens when there's a storm. You know, so it's all part of learning. And I remember hearing a story, I forget who the dancer was, but it was in England. Yes. And she was um, hyperactive and the parents were afraid and, and they and took And she became an uh, amazing, uh, who is it? They took Martha her to a Graham. psychiatrist. Yes, yes. He said, what's wrong with our daughter? And they, he said, let's leave the room, leave her alone. And he just watched her in the room for five minutes and he went back to the parents and said, your daughter's a dancer, put her in dance school. Yes. <laughs> because she just wanted to move all the time. Yes. And exactly, exactly became Martha Graham. Martha Graham, yes. So you've got, to find, story. You've yeah. got to find where those talents lie, whether it be music, yeah. dance or theatre or whatever it is. Yeah. There's, there's one little story that we've got actually got the website for it. Did you hear about this? Recently in America, there was a group of students who were about to do a Master of Arts. I forget the university now, but um, they all quit. 
They got a few weeks into the course because the structure had changed, the, the management had changed, and they were changing the course around them from what it was meant to be. They meant to end up char charging them more money and it wasn't what they thought they were going to be learning when they started. And the entire class resigned oh, okay. from the course. <laughs> and this is one of the top master of arts courses in, in America. Wow. You know, so they've taken a stand. Can you ever see something like that happening in Australia where artists rise up against the inadequate teaching of their craft? Oh, <laughs> I, I wish we had in the past. <laughs> Mm. I based all my teaching on what I would have liked to have been given in the courses I did. They didn't give it, they, it was all verbal teaching in a visual subject where I went to St George Tech many years ago. And so I thought when I started to teach I thought, okay, give them what you would like to have them give you, you know, and I based it all on that. Mm. Anyone else <laughs> want to chime in on this? I've, I've had experience of turning up to a course and uh, the tutor's just been there to put his hand out and collect the money. I, I was terribly disappointed and um, I'd done other courses at this, um, this place and uh, was very happy with them. But um, that, that was a, that was a one-off, I suppose, so um, it... Was that, for example, a, a full-time professional teacher who actually wasn't that well versed in the industry? Perhaps. No, he was actually he was he was well uh, well founded within the industry and had been around for a long time. So because um, in my experience that happens a lot, where you get full time teachers that sort of just lose track. They just of, it, they just yeah. lost it and he just was was had gone off. Yeah, and I just I just we no one was getting what they needed. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't walk. I, it was only a short course. I sucked it up. <laughs> but um, I find even in my little private school, if I'm not if I'm not somehow adequately dealing with them and their psyches and their, their these these beautiful little beings, mm -hmm. if you don't adequately deal with them, they're, because what I'm doing is I'm asking them to discuss classes with their parents. Firstly, I'm saying, parents, you, um, you come in for the first class, and then we don't want you there <laughs> because the children will edit themselves yeah. or they'll show off or they'll retain the same patterns that they continue at home, um, or they'll co be continually looking for gratification. Do you agree with Render in the package saying that when you're dealing with younger kids, a lot of the time it's babysitting? Uh, it, really it, it can, it can be a lot, can but we weed them out, and I actually encourage them to leave my, my classes. That's the beauty about being private um, and having a full-time job. <laughs> I actually have rung parents up and said, I, I don't want your children in my, our classes. And Or if the children are great and the parents are a pain in the <laughs> um, I actually ring the parents up and chat with the parents and mm. say you really need to change your attitude. So I then start training the parents about how they go about looking after their artistic child. Because the artistic child is about play. And adults forget to play because mm. there's nothing in the education system and this is where we need more arts at schools. Well, I totally agree with mm. Patrick here. Mm. We are not nurturing enough uh, of the left right lobe we support mm. sports yeah the great outdoors Aussie I love sportsmen coming into class because they're already physically confident which is fantastic but I also like taking the nerds mm. and making them mentally confident and then through movement physically confident and then saying well have you thought about trying sports now mm. so I think it's a great balance between the two I often find I get um, uh, because the courses we taught at TAFE were cheap there's maybe, in a class of 15, there's maybe three or four people that are really there to learn. Yeah. And the others are there because they're on Centrelink or they don't mm. really care or their parents made them do it for whatever reason. It's like, why are you here? You're an adult. You're paying mm. good money. If you don't want to be here, you know. <laughs> really interesting. I've gone in, as Fiona has as well, I've been asked to go into lots of different schools, both primary and high mm. schools, to teach and teach in specialised functions. And when they do that, I think, they know I'm not a teacher. So I'll go immediately, because I care about what I'm doing, I'll immediately research what I'm doing, set the structure around, around what they want me to provide, and go in and deliver it whiz-bang. With drama, you're often saying to kids, why are you doing these classes? Why are you here? Because oh, it's a bludge, because it's easy. <laughs> and by the well, time that, the I finish that... Most arts classes of any kind in school, <laughs> they're taken because they're the bludge class. Two they're hours or class. three hours after, <laughs> I've got these half a dozen you know, ramshackle boys broken and bleeding. <laughs> and and uh, because I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm the energizer bunny when I take a class and, and they're coming up to me and they're full of respect for you and, mm. and 
full of respect for something they didn't understand. But I think that that's the key, and, and that is the educator um, um, grabbing the attention of the student, allowing the student to want to learn. Yeah. And that's a great educator compared to a not so great educator. The one who can capture the students, any of them, all of them, in that group it can be an ensemble of 50 kids and you have to hold them in the palm of your hand for that hour, mm. that 40 minutes, that hour and a half, two hours, whatever it is, the duration that you have. And that's why we get home from our jobs and, <laughs> <laughs> and do that because you have to be the energizer bunny the whole time and, and the, I guess in a way the, the younger, less experienced, the student, for example, a training band year, three kids, um, what's that? eight-year-old children learning a musical instrument in a group setting of, you know, I've done it up to 70 kids. That's, um, you know, you have to hold them there and there's going to be days where it's not an easy job, but then you have to go back the next day or the next week or whenever it is and work out how you're going to deal with those situations and deliver what you know they need to keep them engaged. I don't know if I could teach young children. I've mainly taught adults, so... <laughs> You know, even high school kids, I don't know if I could teach. I tend to walk into class straight, and uh, I give them the hard words straight away, say, why do you want to do this? Mm. You're not going to make any money at it. You're not going to get rich. Mm. It's actually hard work once you get into it. You know, so work it out now. Mm. This is not an easy course but if you're serious about uh, that's it. That's where we're lucky, um, and I'm sure I speak for all of us. It feels great when we're doing it. When you walk out onto that concert platform, you know, me with this or with a bassoon or my students in front of me, we walk out together and there's the nerves, there's the, the adrenaline and if we are in a great venue, and that's another topic, um, mm -hmm. then that allows us to deliver what we need to and the elation and emotion that comes out of us when we're doing that, that's an incredible thing. Well, that's and that's why we it. keep coming yes. back again and again yeah. and again because yes. we're addicted. <laughs> if you've got the, if they've got the passion, then you can't stop them. Yeah. 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 And if they want to learn, then great. But I just, make, I try to weed out the ones that aren't serious about it up front <laughs> as best right. I can. But us, but us as mentors, us as inspiration for those students, we're the ones that turn those students from mm. perhaps the not so great students into the ones that, you know, they do love you as their mentor. They mm. hold you on a pedestal, and not that that's what you're after, but you know, they see that you enjoy what you're doing and they want that too. Yeah. Mm. So we draw them along. That's Do you enjoy being a teacher, everyone? Yeah, so I mean, there are days that, you know, I question, what am I doing this for? And then it was you that said before, Ian, then you see that child's face, you know, just total elation with their, how much they've achieved. Like I've seen mm. kids run off the stage at five years old and younger, I did it! And you know, the, you're almost crying because you're so happy for them mm. and you go, yep, that's what I'm doing it for. You're almost <laughs> you know? right. And almost, sometimes just go, <laughs> I'd be bawling it, you know? sometimes. I wish that <laughs> yeah. I could just, because, what was that? So happy, I'd be bawling sometimes. Oh yeah, so oh no, I've been, I have yeah, been yeah. crying on the side of the stage as yeah. I've seen kids master things and just, just the confidence to see a three-year-old that was so shy to go and stand on the stage, even if they're going, hi mum. <laughs> Hello, I think that is awesome, you know, because back in my, when I was very young, teaching, when I started in my, when I was 18, I would just like cringe if somebody was standing on the stage waving. I think, oh, what are the parents going to think? They're going to start to think <laughs> I haven't taught them anything. And, but now, it's so, I see the bigger picture, you know, so mm -hmm. if they could just get on. And then when, you know, if parents ever say, oh, she didn't do a lot, or which is never happens now, but, you know, I say, hang on, let me remind, me, remind you. Would you go and stand up there in front of 400 people? Oh, no, 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 no. So we'll give them some credit that maybe mm. they didn't smile, maybe they didn't stretch their feet and legs as much as they could have, but considering there was an audience, a stage, lighting, all of that, they got on there and they and did a you, remarkable job. When you job. see a child, <laughs> child that you, children, or you, even your own children, starting that young, being very nervous, not being very good, Yes. And as yeah. they develop, and if they do, like my son has, chosen a career in this, uh, in music and acting, mm. and he's very good now. But his early stuff wasn't necessarily great, That's the stuff he would do at school. Process. It's a process. It's a, it's a, you yeah. look at it at the very beginning of a process that yeah. might lead to something if they choose yeah. to pursue it. I think a teacher is just all these little rewards, isn't it? You know, it's, that's, that's our reward. Mm. Our reward as teachers is seeing their little milestones all the time, whether they be this or this age or an adult. 
you know, I think that's our biggest reward. And that's right. something that the arts delivers, and that's why it should be in schools. Yeah. Thank you. That's a good note to end on. <laughs> Peter, do we have another question? We sure do. Sam has one for us. Sam? Um, I'd just like to know what we're doing to help music festivals grow. Um, we've had a number of this year close down and come, up, come back to tell us that they're not running uh, next year. What are we doing as an industry to help uh, grow the, the opportunities for bands to tour around Australia? Well, this is the other thing, like Big Day Out's closed down, all these big festivals uh, just can't operate anymore. They can't be financially viable. We've got Soundwave, I think, is still running. Um, that's a business model, I think, that sort of had its day, unfortunately. And we don't have anything to replace it yet. What do you think, Patrick? I think uh, they're expensive ventures mm. and um, probably fraught with risk uh, in, many, in many ways. So I think probably there's, yeah, less attractive reasons for people to, to host them. It's difficult and perhaps, you know, from um, you know, classical festivals, they're, they're difficult to run, getting the audience to come along. Mm. How do you get the, the money out of them to, to pay for the event? So, um, tricky. They're big, because I've, I've been involved a little bit in the organising of these big festivals and they're, they're hard. It's expensive and it's hard work and you, it's really difficult to make your money back on these to organise them. So, yes, Pete, you got a, a thought on this? I, I do. I was a concert promoter once in the Northern Territory and as a promoter in that era, um, which was some time ago now, I could even have a liquor licence for three days, it's the Northern Territory, um, I could have a liquor licence for three days as an adjunct to the festival. It was that great to run a music or a community event there then in that era. Now what seems to have happened, not only in, in the Northern Territory, but Australia wide. We followed America down the litigious path. We have the lawyers are getting paid, the insurance companies are getting paid, and the security for for, for uh, security companies because you have to have more security in, in the audience uh, than, than the audience now, just about, in order to run a, a, an event. So the cost that these promoters have to endure, not only to bring the mainstream artists out and accommodate them and their entourage, but to just ensure the festival and to provide security for the festival, it becomes cost prohibitive and, and that's why those big yeah, ones are falling. After the accident of Big Day Out, that became a big deal. Public liability insurance for buskers even is, has stopped a lot of people mm. from forming on the streets yeah. because they just can't afford the public liability. Yeah. Uh, buskers of any kind. Uh, just to wrap up, Pete, we've got one final question, have we? We, we do, Stevens with me with a, on another topic, I think. G'day. Um, I go to Ties Hill up in Newcastle to learn music business. Now, do you think that learning music business would be a good idea for your students or people that you mean teaching? Um, for me, teaching film, I do. I've actually taught production classes where we teach effectively the business of making a film. And we talk budgets and schedules and distribution and copyright issues, all of that kind of stuff. Um, I think it is important to teach business skills because most artists these days have to be freelance, independent businesses. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. Yes, Patrick? Yeah, look, I, I totally agree. E even things down to writing a CV, the, yeah. the number that come across my desk on a weekly basis, you know, you, you want to see what's there, it's got to be done the right way and things like, um, well, I guess it depends what course they might be wanting to teach, mm. you know, might determine how you perceive them. So, you, you know, I, I think having uh, a knowledge of business and how they can run their business effectively, I think it's critical. And I think artists and, well, musicians are especially are notorious for not billing on time, not <laughs> billing at all, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I guess it's a simple thing, but we get so wrapped up in the art mm, that we right. forget to yeah. do the important thing, which mm. feeds the family. Yeah. I think it was um, one of our guests last month, the photographer, uh, I think was telling me that he had a colleague who thought, I've got this money, should I buy a new camera and do this? No, go and do a business course, mm. learn how to run a business. What do you guys think? Fiona? Uh, yeah, I definitely, uh, definitely agree that you do need to do business. Built into our diploma course, it's not in the certificate, but in the diploma is a whole unit for 10 weeks that they learn how to write a portfolio, well they do a portfolio, so dance is a very visual thing, so they have to put together a portfolio, short one, resume, cover letter, how to freelance. They also have to um, understand how to find work, um, what organisations they need to tap into, and this is across the world, so we're not just looking in Australia. Dance, unfortunately, most dancers go away overseas, get the experience, come back to Australia and go, look what I've done. Mm. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of younger artists that are going out 
um, for the first time have to go overseas. I've got a number of dancers at the moment um, professionally overseas because there isn't enough jobs here. So I think that they, they need to, so when we're tapping into organisations, it's not just obviously in Australia, we have very few really. Uh, so it's understanding what's out there in America, New York City and different parts of the world. And they've all got different laws and rules. And they've and, all got, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, obviously we can't teach them everything, but it does give them a bit more realistic you know, view on things, so they don't finish the course and go, I'm so skilled, I'm, I'm ready to conquer the world, but I don't really know how to <laughs> how buy a <laughs> ticket for the bus, you know? Um, and how to, like dancers need to be able to wash and clean, and they need to also learn normal stuff, like how to live, how to pay rent, how to, I know that sounds really silly. How to deal with tax in whatever country you're how in. How to pay, put, put aside some tax, put, mm. how, how do you market yourself? What, just Market's basic stuff, one, yeah. you know, we're constantly training our dancers, not just in the actual physical dance, but how to live from mm. day to day. Mm. You know, no, mum's not going <laughs> to do that when you're overseas. That's you when know? they're young. Ian, yeah. as, a, as an actor, yeah. actors are a, a, a one man business, one woman business generally. They are. Uh, they rely on an agent, but they still need to be a business Unless in their own right. you're really good and you can draw a manager in mm. to look after your life for you. And you can trust them. That's <laughs> and you can trust them. So at the end of the day, uh, we tell the kids, uh, this is show business. Mate, two words there. Show. Yeah. Business. Yeah. And there's no business quite you've like got it. <laughs> <laughs> there is no business like show business. So you've got to be able to cover both. Yeah. And um, yeah, then the conversation starts. Very much so these days because musicians, filmmakers, um, theatre people generally, you are your own business. Every, everyone in the film industry especially, you're a freelancer. That's how it works. You, most of the people behind the cameras, even myself, we all have our own business names, our own ABNs, the whole deal. We are businesses, even if it's a one-man band. Mm. You've got to learn to do it that way. And the, the beauty is of today, there's so much information available to you on the net. It's easy. Mm. And if you, you don't know, get it you in care, your... If you care and you want to be out there, sit down. I'd say sit down, learn, take it in, watch YouTube, watch how you do things. Yeah, you know, we, we're learning arts on YouTube. Yes. Why aren't we learning business on YouTube? You can be. You can do. And if you don't yeah. get in your course, do a, do a dedicated business course. It all applies. Same basic deals. Thank you very much, Pete. Is there something you want to wrap up with? No more questions, Your Honour. Okay. Thanks, Pete.